We potentially can go anywhere. Eventually we starve through food. So we give them a lot of ALA, so they need a lot of iron, but the iron is not there because there's so much production that eventually this feeding without iron will make the cells destroy themselves. So that's a smart part. What are you waiting for? Welcome to Target Cancer Podcast. My name is Dr. Sanjay Janeja. I'm a hematologist and medical oncologist, also known as the Onc Doc on social media. And I'm super excited about this episode for so many reasons. Number one, you've heard me say multiple times, you know, one of the most terrible cancers or contrasting from a terrible cancer, I use the example of GBM, glioblastoma multiform. It's a very scary diagnosis. It involves a very important organ like the brain, and it's just challenging to treat. We have someone who is looking into a a technology that blew my mind, no pun intended, in such a crazy way. And as a guy that used to teach physics for the MCAT for Princeton Review, I'm really excited to get into the physics of it, but I think everyone will appreciate it. Today, I am honored to have Dr. Ellie Benane, who is the chief medical officer of Sense, And this technology looks into a whole different degree of anything we've discussed on this podcast before. And we're just gonna get into it because I'm afraid we're gonna, and I know I'm gonna wanna run over. So. Uh, Ellie, it's so good to have you, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Sanjay. Very excited also. Uh, have the opportunity to talk about this incredible technology. Yeah. When I, when I first heard about it, I was obsessed because, number one, it's a very scary cancer, right? Like, when somebody tells me that their family member has GBM or glioblastoma, I, I, a part of me hurts because I've seen just how challenging it is. And one of the reasons it's so challenging is one, it's in a very intimate organ, obviously, the brain, which is hard to reach with a lot of therapies. We've talked about blood-brain barrier, which means people don't know, but there's like a sanctuary, basically, that exists for your central nervous system. Evolutionarily, it makes sense. It wants to protect itself from the typical bugs that you get all the time and everything because you need that organ to be able to do, you know, put food in your mouth and think. So we have this way that's supposed to be adaptive to protect it. But then when we're talking about therapies wanting to target it, it's almost like a something that's supposed to be good. It makes things more challenging. So one, you're able to get into that sanctuary of sorts, um, conceivably with your technology, which we'll talk about. But number two, because we can't get into it that effectively, we're doing things that damage a very vital organ. Like, right, you know, the mainstay is pretty simple. It's, I feel bad when people message me and say, what else can we do? I'm like, unfortunately, it really is just surgery, radiation, and, and uh, you know, an alkylator, chemo drug that there's just not a lot else. You can wear a cap, you know, all the time, every day, which decreases your quality of life. And you said, I don't know about that. Let's not let that just be the answer. And that's where Sonola Sense comes in. It uses kind of nerdier stuff. The last two episodes prior to uh, at the time of this recording, actually, we're on metabolic and a metabolic approach. We always talk about targeted therapy, but metabolic means can we take the things and tools that a cancer is using for energy, the coal that you put into a tra- you know, a train to keep it running, can we basically mess that up so that it can't even have at a very basic level its ability to propagate all these you know, targets and, and things that help it grow and resist? Let's just go to the core. And that's what you asked. You said, can we monopolize or hack the very nutrition or tools it needs to survive as a cell alone? I think I want to rewrite the script. How, and, and that's what you did, right? What did you look into to say, how can we take advantage of the fact it needs coal to make this train run, to use a very simple example? And not, and not, and not only that, Craig, so what we're taking advantage, I think, is that the glutonary of the cell, correct? So the cell needs to eat. The malignant cell, cell is you know, more, is hungrier than the normal cell, correct? And they need right. this 5 ALA <laughs> to build their different proteins inside their body, say inside, inside the cell. Right? So 5 ala is necessary to eventually make him. So all cells have him, right? So you need that component, that nutrient, right? So the cells, the tumor cells are ha- avid for this, for this uh, product, for this protein. Once they eat a lot of it, Correct. They start running out of iron, correct, and then they start pushing out protoporphyrin. You know, if you remember all the heme, <laughs> you know, how do we make heme? There's this thing called protoporphyrin nine. So what happens? There's too much protoporphyrin nine, not enough uh, iron, 
and then the then this ROS, this you know bad oxygen, gets produced and kills the cells. So we're taking not only advantage of the metabolic, uh, I would say, pro, uh, program of the cells, but even their needs, like basic needs that they are hungry for this 5-ALA. So this is beautiful, correct? Because at the end, you don't expect toxicity from it. You don't expect uh, even, you know, any other problems. You don't, you don't see having effects on the normal cells because it's just the normal food for these cells, correct? Even resistance, correct? So potentially, you should not even expect resistance because the cell is not going to be become resistant by not being fed. So the, the cell will, will always need nutrients. It's not going to create a resistance by saying, oh, I'm not going to take any more 5-ALA. I, I'm done. I'm on, di on a diet. They're going to die. Okay, so they're not going to go that way to create resistance. And that's what I find so fascinating because the episode we had, you know, Thomas, Dr. Thomas Seafried has his own opinions and he basically talked about how let's just forget what the cancer cells are expressing for a second downstream. What protein? What is the KRAS that makes it grow or what is the EGFR? He goes, let's talk about what they need to even make those receptors that are, or those those proteins to help those proliferators. We attack, you know, KRAS and EGFR and all these things. He goes, let's go down to the basics. And that's what you're saying. In the similar way, it's when, you know, somebody that's working out, right, compared to, to me, the, to my old me. I used to work out and I don't now. But if someone's in the gym lifting all the time, what is the one thing they say? Bro, are you getting enough protein? You're not going to grow with enough without protein and creatine, right? The muscles won't get bigger. So they are eating a lot and a lot of calories. And to your point, and we say it all the time, cancers grow fast. That's what that's what the, that's how standard chemo at the very beginning uh, came out, like just simple chemo from uh, decades ago. We know they replicate fast. Let's damage damage the replication process, right? Which is the DNA and and the copying. You're saying we know they grow fast, but because the other things also replicate and DNA gets damaged, let's do something that damages other things hopefully less. Let's attack the thing they need to replicate, the fuel, Correct. the coal, the protein in the body lifter, and, they, and you're trying to hack and take advantage of that system. Why? Because fundamentally, we know that they require more of it. So if you can find a way to take the tool that they need to just even be able to like sustain and make those receptors and everything that makes it terrible, then make it implode on itself. And that's why it's targeted, because if your cranial cells, or excuse me, if your, your other central nervous cells or the other cells don't have it in these amounts, or you're not attacking it, and that's what I'd like to talk to, let's talk about, because somebody might say, well, why are they using coal or protein that, uh, you know, supplementation that no one else does? It's not that they're not using it. You're targeting a way to activate the food that they're eating to make it poisonous. You're basically turning an elegant meal into cyanide for that cancer, and you're be doing it collectively, like in a way in surgery, but without the actual surgery removal. Correct. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I love uh, you know the word that my CEO that uses all the time. He says, we, we make a smart bomb, correct? We put mm, exactly yeah. that that amount of, of food, we put that amount of energy and those cells get destroyed. One of the points that you brought, it's very, very important, correct? We are really agnostic to any mutation, correct? Before you get expression of this or that, which mutation do you have? What does the drive the cancer or not? We're getting to the more primitive, or is how the cells mm -hmm. get formed. Like you say, all these other expressions, or these other you know, uh, transcription factors, receptors, doesn't matter. Correct. So it is a target, targeted therapy without having to target to a specific mutation or a specific receptor. So that's also what it makes it, you know, I will say, impressive. I will say that this is what we see. We, we hope that this platform, this therapy, really will be another option for patients, correct? That eventually, hopefully, will negate other therapies that are invasive, correct? That's what we eventually we, we try. What happens in oncology, we always go after everything else, correct? So we want to try a new therapy, don't touch the standard of care, 
just add it to whatever it is and you go through the recurrent, the stage four, the relapse diseases, which are the worst population. In our case, you know, you, you, you know this very well, when there's recurrency or relapse, the tumors gain other pathways. They get other aber chromosomal aberrations. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter to us, okay? Because we're gonna treat, you know, the same way the initial tumor or the protected or, you know, evolved tumor into something nastier, okay? Who knows, maybe the nastier tumor will respond better, okay? <laughs> because it's reproducing faster. We don't know that yet, correct? But theoretically, that could happen. So this is the beauty of, of this, of using really non-invasive therapies. It, it, it is, you know, you talk about GBM, and, and, and you know, we also treat another brain tumor in children, which is even more complicated, which is, is um, called a diffuse, um, diffuse intrinsic uh, glioma, the synthetic pontine glioma. So these are rare tumors. They are on the pond. That's why they are diffuse, but in, in, intrinsic, right? They're very into the pond that you cannot do surgery on them. Right? These kids, you know, this is one of the gliomas, and they, like, you know, glial cells are what supports, you know, the neurons and the brain, etc. So it is very hard to get there, even through blood barrier, even, you know, you, you cannot even do surgery in these patients, correct? And, and they do terribly. These kids do awful. The only therapy is radiation therapy and steroids. And, you know, the, the effect of the, the therapy is terrible. Most of these kids don't survive, you know, by two years, maybe 1% survive. The overall survival in clinical trials is nine months. Uh, and they have a terrible quality of life, terrible quality of life. So now we're already running a clinical trial where we're treating these children with our therapy in escalating doses, you know, and so far safety looks good. Hopefully we'll be presenting great data in the future. Yeah, we just started this, this protocol. But can you imagine kids that they have a tumor that you cannot reach. You can, even the biopsies are very complicated. So they don't even get, most of them don't get even biopsy. They get radiation and they are left to die. Correct? That's what it is. So we're, it, it, it does. So, so, yeah, so when you say GPM and they're so restricted, imagine how important this is in children. I'm a pediatric oncologist by training, correct? So I have a special place in my heart for children with cancer. And, if there is a, a disease in pediatric oncology that needs new therapies, is the IPG. It, it is, you know, it is something that drives drives me to come to work every day. And on top of that, GBM. So GBM is, is terrible disease. You know, I've been involved in, in therapy of GBM for a long time, and having something that will potentially really have produced tumor reductions in this in these patients you know it, it will be it will be amazing so we're also running then this recurrent gbm study so hopefully we'll have uh, data pretty soon we pardon this interruption real quick if you're enjoying this podcast or find it valuable for what we discuss and the education and how people see and think about cancer in general we would very much appreciate a like subscribe and especially a share so we can bring that information as maximally and broadly as possible thank you so much for listening yeah, i use the example of gbm because at least maybe people have heard of it but truly if we're talking about the worst cancer at least statistically it is dipg for the emotional component of children, right? And also it's even actually worse. Like you said, it's about not even nine months uh, when you're looking at trials. The you know GBM survival is less than 5% in five years, but we're talking a whole nother level with the IPG. Now, the thing that we need to highlight is when you're using, you know, when you're saying the example of, you know, it's even worse and you can't go get it and take it out, you can only use radiation. The key is, is because it's in such an intimate area. The problem is the way we treat these lesions is basically like you just accept collateral damage. Like in a GBM, you kind of talk about what is going to happen if you remove it. And even during the surgery, sometimes the doctor will let the patient be awake but not feel anything if they love singing just to know how much can they cut out so that they can still sing for quality of life purposes because truth is they're probably not going to be cured of it right stage four automatically even if it's a spec so that is the biggest challenge is how do you 
like for something where we're limited to what the extent of collateral damage is to even try to take out that bad population or rogue colony, that's what the mortality is so bad. If it was in a, in a breast, you know, it's like you can do a lumpectomy and you can just cut out liberally. Right. And so that's what makes your technology so interesting because you're saying we can bypass, we can stop thinking about, you know, removing or destroying either by radiation with the destruction or removing with surgery. We can actually go ahead and hijack one of the things that makes it different than other cells, which is how much it has to eat. So one strategy that we've had with previous guests is this whole concept of limiting like in a metabolic level what they can eat. And the example I thought of one night was how you can attack a castle all day and they can they can have great nights with better techno you know technology and armor and, and a moat. And then some war veteran somewhere in the distant past said, hey, instead of attacking the castle and, and, and having damage at the same time of our own army, let's just cut off all the food supply they can have. Let's just post up shop. Let's go all around this castle. And they basically starved out. The, the, that was their strategy. They're like, they can't even feed this big army they have. Now, that's one strategy, but the problem is everyone else starves in the process, right? So when you use these metabolic strategies with glutamate inhibitors or keto uh, ketosis, you have a little bit of an injury on your white blood cells and on maybe on your muscles, so you have to take breaks. What you're doing is even a heightened example. It's like, let the, let the, the crops continue to come, but we're just gonna go in the back and do a lot of pesticide. And then when they eat it and only them, like they're gonna be the ones that die and you do it because you activate it. Like that's the key and you activate it with directed therapy. That's what I wanna make sure is very clear before you explain this to us. You're using a technology that we already use to identify tumors, right? We use ALA to, to see exactly regionally on these fancy scans, MRI and CT. We know it's uptaken, yeah. for lack of a better word, in the cancer. That's how we visualize it. And you said, or your team says, can we now use, and this is the physics geek part that I love, is there some play we can use with wavelengths or basically a sprinkle that says now, and then uses that same thing we already used to visualize things to now activate something that's gonna destroy that cell, if I understand it. Yeah, so- And that's your targeted concept. What you're saying it's not gonna be on everything. Right, so, you know, as you very well mentioned, all this therapy is based on this uptake of 5-ALA, which has 30 years of history, Craig. This has been done for a long time. Well, one of the things that was learned is that if you use special fluorescence or, discrete or a special light, you can see on the tumor where it does fluoresce, correct? And then you can come and cut. So we have all that safety. So people start saying, well, what it was if we use photons? What if we use light? Correct? And then people start using light to activate ALA to eventually have protoporphyrin produce the ROSs. That is, has been done for a long time too. And there is evidence there is th where if you put a light into a GBM patient that have received ALA and you put the lasers inside the brain and there are people that have done that, you see an activity you see an activation of the 5 LA, the whole process, and destruction of the tumor. And we, all, we, we have some of that data, but the beauty of our founder, Craig, who has been working on photodynamic therapy for <laughs> over 20 years, is that he says, you know what? You can create light using sound. So the same principle then using ultrasound waves can activate this minute, this micro moment of light with the frequency of the ultrasound externally. So you don't have to put a, a laser through your brain or anywhere that you want to test this. You just put the ultrasound and get the same effect. That's the beauty. So, so the photodynamic therapy eventually becomes sonodynamic therapy. So instead of using a source of light, we use sound to create, to activate the, the effect uh, on the 5 ALA on the cell. And as, I mean, that is, that is so incredible because as far as I know, sound waves aren't very damaging. They are to your eardrums, but they're not actually destroying things. And that's why the name I thought it was so clever is Sonola Sense. The other beauty is, you know, ultrasounds have become extremely 
you know, detail, extremely, you know, detail, correct? So you can measure anything, correct, with an ultrasound. Yeah, we do it at the heart, we do it at the fetuses, we do it everywhere, correct? So you can measure exactly where the tumor is. You can measure the, the thickness of the skull or the thickness of the bladder or whatever it is that you, so you can really, really target the energy very specifically to the areas that you need using ultrasound. Right, without having to put a needle through your cranium. I mean, it's incredible. And the, the beauty is too, you know, I didn't appreciate when I was in training, everyone would talk about the healthcare costs and don't order too many labs and this and that. And I just didn't appreciate then how much it translates to what a problem there is in this country with insurance and bills and all that. Like it, it, it is truly parasitic. Ultrasounds are actually surprisingly, we're talking about a very high level technology treatment without necessarily having a very high cost on the on the apparatus that at least activates like ultrasounds are generally pretty cheap compared to you know some of these PET scans and MRIs and but you know, obviously all the like all the, very costly correct and eventually you know all these prototypes always have a lot of costs correct but eventually you know the idea is to use you know that you will have a a device in your office and you will treat the patient either with a cap or, you know, if it's uh, an abdominal ultrasound, if you want to treat uh, bladder cancer, uh, et cetera. So we, we have started all this in, this in the brain, correct? Because there was a device already treating uh, essential tremors in, in the brain that was approved by the FDA. So we took advantage of that to treat this terrible two diseases in pediatrics and in adults. But if you see this as a platform you start thinking outside the brain, right? Well, you know, this works. Why can't we do this, you know, non-invasive therapy outside the, the cranium, correct? Everybody uses, you can ultrasound anything in the body, correct? You can inject ALA, yeah. ALA, and then put your ultrasound in that area where the ALA is captured. So the same way, for example, that you, you're mentioning that you use ALA to circumscribe the tumor in the brain. Well, urologists have been doing this for a long time in bladder, correct? So in bladder cancer, in bladder cancer genome, especially the, uh, the non-invasive, the non-muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer genome. So we are looking also into that, correct? To look for some type of device that will not be in the brain, that you can have in your office, that urologists can treat the patients, right? Instead of doing surgery, They'll use the ultrasound, correct? Uh, so think about this just not a, as an intracranial device or therapy, but really as a platform. So now you start thinking, where, where do I put this in the sequence of therapies, correct? Because you know you're going to start saying, well, if this should I treat my patients with bladder cancer with this before I give them v BCG injections or you know do some cystoscopic, you know therapy, maybe this is the first thing. What about a neoadjuvant in many diseases, correct? Then you could say, you know what, before even we do surgery, we're gonna use some dynamic therapy to reduce the tumor, and then we're gonna go and, and, and do the surgery. Or maybe we don't need surgery anymore, correct? Maybe this is, you know, like I used to, I love to say, if, if, if you are a fan of Star Trek, you remember the doctor passing this, handheld MRI, correct? Can you imagine doing that? That you had this handheld ultrasound and you just injected pe people with, uh, you know, 5 ALA and you just pass it where it needs to be treated. Okay, tumor is gone. Right? So these are the things that, the, the potential of what this technology can get to. I mean, it's crazy because we're like taking out, you know, significant portions of organs sometimes just for diagnosis alone. Like a colon cancer, we're just like, we're just gonna take out half of it have the risk of you know post-surgical complication and an ostomy bag and then we actually have a stage and decide how we're going to treat it you're talking about something where like whether it's in the lymph nodes or not potentially this is a this is an ideal world but whether it is or isn't if you give a therapy that you can activate it's going to die like ideal in an ideal world so that you don't you can stop having to take out you know up front immediately a pancreatic you have to do a whole whipples procedure right and there's all kinds of downstream issues with that right when it comes to like getting your supplementation and your folate and b12 and people have problems with those major surgeries if you could conceivably to a we're talking on to the cell right with the naked eye you have to have 
like billions basically of cells in one place on a CT scan you need you know I don't know 100 200 million to see it you're talking about all the way down not to 200 million but to 10 million but to a million you're talking to the last cell that uses ALA if you're able to activate it and it's using it at a higher amount than other places that thing will die yeah and we, you know if you really see what is happening in the cell this is even smaller than the organelles correct what that amount of energy that gets there that luminescence if you want that is really sound that it's activating the size is smaller than the organelles so you're really really going going basically almost so molecular into that correct to really have an effect on those malignant cells i mean this i i'm just trying to wrap my head around it basically you're going to have a lot a lot a lot of people mad at you in the pharma industry that's like if this something could truly be a catch-all because you're you're attacking something that has to do with growth potential so so walk through this with me so i understand correctly if i have god forbid a cancer or whoever does you're injecting through the vein ala correct you want to basically because you you know we know with a lot of study and evidence in the past that the things that require the fuel are going to pick it up more. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's kind of the same concept of doing a PET scan where your PET scan for most cancers can tell you where there is possibly a cancer or something is hot because you're using something much simpler, the glucose metabolism. It doesn't mean all, all cancers light up, but in that sense, you're doing an IV in hopes that you can capture to see where it's being but, picked up. But right? our, this is a whole, a whole people. But this is even better, correct? Because yeah. when you do, you just five, five ALA for surgery, when you do the PET, you are limited by the fluorescence or the PET avidity, correct? Of your, your right. contrast to light up, correct? And then you can see. Right. In our case, we don't need to be that precise. So even cells that are not to the level of fluorescence, but they are uptaking malignant cells, that you say, uh, where are the borders here? At the end, it doesn't matter because we don't want to do that. We don't need to be that focused ultrasound, correct? Right. We, we need to be in the ballpark and our margins, if you want, Correct. Instead of surgical mar margins, uh, our ultrasound margin can be much bigger because there is no toxicity, and we are including cells that are malignant that are using ALA for survival and growth, but are not shining, are not fluorescent. That you cannot see. That you cannot see. That's a key. Is because people need to understand that the reason we just can't do a PET scan on everyone is, you know, depending if the cancer is aggressive enough, you need it to be five, six millimeters at best to even see it light up. And when people use this term, you know, oh, you had a recurrence after the curative surgery for stage three, nine months later, I don't, you know, I think it's a misnomer to call it a recurrence. It's a persistence. persistence. You had a persistence of cells that you could not visualize with the naked eye and even a scan because simply there were not enough. What happens with what you're doing is whether you can visualize it or not, we know local regionally where things spread. You do a sentinel node for breast cancer. You do all the lymph nodes around a, a half of a colon when you're cutting out. You're saying, hey, get in the ballpark because we're not giving you a toxic element like like right out, out the gates. We're giving you something that's natural that things use. And we know that there is a significant like larger proportion that it tries to use this tool when they're growing. Yeah. And, and, and uh you know, that really will be amazing, correct? If we can use this therapy before anything else. Unfortunately, we need to prove it, correct? So we need to prove it in the current environment and we need to prove it that it's safe in there. But the hope then, and really that is, once we demonstrate that, is to start bringing it earlier and earlier in the, in the process. And for certain diseases that really there's no therapy, you know, I think we're going to bring them earlier, correct? Even DIPG, correct? Right now, we're going after yeah. after after radiation. No doubt about it, correct? That's a standard we'll go after. But if we really, really, really show amazing results, which parent will allow their kid to go to radiation first when they saw, you know, tumor reduction with sonodynamic therapy, correct? So right now, we will do that. But if if and when our our therapy shows activity in these children, 
the next step will be, well, can we do this before radiation, correct? Yeah. And then eventually and you, and not you, use you, radiation. And you made me think of an important concept when you said if there's not any alternatives anyway. Anyone listening to this, I want you to know that there's a lot of legislation that's come out uh, in policy in the last probably year or two years where people are realizing that compassionate use of certain drugs, whether it's approved already in other cancer types, if you're listening to this and you're like, they say there's nothing else, but this may or may not work, a lot of states in the US have said, hey, if there's evidence, if it makes sense, and it's literally compassionate use and there's no alternative options, you should go to either your oncologist, you should go to your institutions like board, or you can even go to your policymakers or your advocacy group. A lot of uh, states have advocacy groups to say, hey, I need help for this on me, my child, and so and so, because there's a lot of stuff being written that you know your doctor, including myself as an oncologist, just may not be aware of, and you can get those assistance. So that's important that I wanted to say. And I also wanted to say, like, especially with DIPG, with those alternatives, that's where like with the X cures, um, where you can basically register to see if there's trials, they've really had this big push in DC to try to bring more attention and dollars to something that's A, rare disease. It's hard to justify to industry or to research, hey, there's such few cases, can you see if the, you know, the DIPG like research can be there? I think they have a trial now, OKN007, which is an IV therapy yeah. for DIPG that one can get access to. The IPG, there's a concept that we don't talk too much in oncology, especially in pediatric oncology, but it is on the rare disease side, correct? There's something called rare diseases, ultra rare diseases, correct? And they get a specific pathway at the FDA to accelerate and to get therapies for a reduced number of patients, correct? Um, it, it, to be treated, correct? So, but these are non-oncological patients, right? So what I think we need to do when you talk about Congress and about groups is really to see something like the IPG as an ultra orphan Correct? Oncology disease, correct? That it, it is not in thousands and thousands and thousands of patients that are going to be interested on, from, in the industry, correct? To, to say, oh, we're going to have a program at DIPG because we're going to make X amount of money. So we need to find ways to fund this, this type of thing and to accelerate the access to new therapies to these patients. So one of the things that a lot of these groups are doing and we are certainly supporting is the idea that of ultra orphan diseases in oncology. So DIPG is one of those. So if you really have to go and do a thousand patient study, double blind, placebo control, you, you will never finish, correct? Uh, th this never is the, Half of them would pass away before the time the enrollment happened because it's so fatal and that's so sad. Correct. So this is what, what it's happening now. There's a lot of work being done from the, 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 the family groups, the patients, uh, to really push legislation to accelerate all this, especially all these very rare pediatric diseases or the ones that have no oncology diseases, and certainly the ones that have no, no, no available therapies. That's such a good point. I mean, I, I just want everyone to hear that. There's at least there's, uh, I get encouraged when I hear reasonability on behalf of you know bureaucracy and red tape. But if you missed it or it's unclear, what you are saying for the listener is that when you are designated under something like ultra rare or rare or ultra rare oncology, those parameters that are realistically impossible to actually like reach the recruitment and power, you know, these terms you use in your statistics class, you know, in um, step one of medicine, these things just are not applicable to these scenarios. And so there's a modified, more reasonable- But, the, but, that, but that doesn't exist in doesn't exist in oncology, exists in non-oncological diseases, correct? In very oh, all together, all together, but not in oncology, correct? So that is why, oh, yeah. So that in oncology, there is no a concept of ultra rare pediatric oncology disease. There are ultra rare, ultra orphan, etc., but not in the oncology world. Yes, there is certain mechanisms like accelerated approval and things like that, but I think the bar has to keep getting lower and lower to make sure that, you know, these children get access to, you know, potential new therapies. That's all, I mean, that is awful. Yeah, it's just, that's awful. Okay. 
well, that's something definitely we need to work on, you know. So one, um, this is my question. So if I, if you get ALA, right, intravenously and say you have pancreatic or God forbid or colorectal or whatever else, hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer, and then you're doing the ultrasound and you're basically hitting that exact, you know, sound frequency to activate. I have two questions. The second one, maybe we can answer a second if that's okay, which is, what is activating and how is it dying? But number one, number one, how are you not activating the ALA uptake that is occurring to some degree uh, in the surrounding healthy tissue, number one? So say in the liver cancer patient where they may already have cirrhosis or have, have you know, some impaired liver function, which is always a concern with Y90 radiation beads and chemoembolization. We always kind of have to measure how much good, you know, healthy tissue will be left. Number one, how do you not activate them? Or if you're activating them, does it not really matter because the uptake was so small? Yeah. And then two, what is happening exactly that's making this thing just blow up? Yeah, so let's start with the first one. And and, and there's two great points that, that I want to make. And one is, uh, it's a, ex, I will say, it's a experiment in nature, and I'll explain in a second. Uh, the other one is, you know, why not other normal cells will get activated? The, the issue, right. well, remember the activation happens because there is an excess of protoporphyrin 9. So if you give, the normal cell has the ALA, picks it up, correct, okay, goes through the whole heme pathway, here's iron, makes him. That's it. It's not going to die. It's just doing their normal effect. Remember what happens is the, the cells are rapidly uh, reproducing are going to take more and more FIALA and are going to need more iron to move from the protoporphyrin to the heme. Okay, one of the last steps on heme formation. Okay, but now the cells is growing so fast and we're feeding them to grow fast that don't have any more iron. And that's when then it, you have this uber you know, amount of protoporphyrin 9 that gets activated by light and now by sound. So that's the beauty of this. Normal cells will not get activated because they don't have excess, they don't produce excess protoporphyrin. They go into the him. They're just going to make him. They're not going to, that's why we talk about, you know, no toxicity. That's why we talk about not having potential resistance. Okay, normal cells, they will, they, they will not produce ex, excessive protoporphyrin that will make all these, you know, oxygen radicals that will destroy the cells. Sorry, is that the same way like when people have porphyria? That's, have well, that's, that that's that, no, this is, so this is experimental. This is an experiment in nature, correct? So there is something called erythroporphyria, correct? <laughs> and then where you have an ex excess production of protoporphyrin, a nine and you are very susceptible, uh, susceptible to light, correct? So these patients cannot be outside, they get terrible scaring, they cannot get light, and they leave, they go out at night so they don't get, uh, you know, the effects, the false sensitivity. And the level of protoporphy, protoporphy in, the, in, their, in their blood is thousands X of what you will generate you know, with our therapy. And those patients, they do have a little decrease on on life expectancy, but they live until their 40s, 50s. They don't get cancers long-term. They have some liver issues because when they have too much interporphyria, uh, um, protoporphyrin, they may block some blockage of biliary, you know, ducts, etc., in the liver, but not to the point that gets cirrhosis or need a liver transfer or things like that. So one of the things that we potentially will treat in the future is cholangiocarcinoma. Why? Because there's a lot of protoporphyrin being generated in the cholangiocarcinomas. So if we can activate that and also only affect the cells that are malignant, so anything in you know liver cancer but cholangios, both of them, you know, will be extremely susceptible to this. There's a lot of preclinical work on using um, ALA, and I'm not, well, it's not even, 
preclinical in the sense these are patient samples and things like that, but you can see expression of you know protoporphyrin luminescence in almost every carcinoma. Correct? Cells are reproduced very fast. You know, there's there's a lot of papers, and this has been used for photodynamic therapy. So we potentially can go anywhere, correct, and damage just the cancer cells and not the benign cells because they're not going to produce excess of protoporphyrin. They're not going to get activated, and they're going to die. Just this glutonary, these gluttons of cancer cells, correct, are going to die because they're going to have too much protoporphyrin nine, not enough iron. And that's so that's the way we eventually we starve through food so we give them a lot of uh, a lot of uh, ALA so they need a lot of iron but the iron is not there correct if, because th there's so much production that eventually this feeding without iron will make the cells destroy themselves so that's a smart bomb what are you waiting for? Can we just get it in all cancers, please? This sounds, this is, I mean, this is, you know, what I'm really thinking on hearing you speak is, is the thing that I hate seeing, that my heart breaks for, is when I see peritoneal carcinomatosis, which yeah. basically means, like, for the ovarian cancer or appendix cancer, I had a friend write me today about it um, in a loved one, and you see, basically, it's very hard to reach at high enough levels of chemotherapy standard high enough concentrations of this cytotoxic poison chemotherapy to things that are kind of abutted or just stuck on or tacked on on top of your intestines. Eventually, it makes intestines hard to have this beautiful, you know, ability to kind of relax and squeeze to get, you know, bowels moving. And it's just a stubborn disease. And we've tried in, in kind of a poor man's way, and we still do, to put chemo in the belly and shake it around and hope you can just kill some of that disease that it gets exposed to in the same way as, as doing for bladder cancer, like you mentioned. But like, I just can't imagine being able to dissolve something that is so difficult to reach uh, IV just from a concentration of enough cytotoxic therapy. Is there, are there any tumor types that maybe it is hard to reach enough vascular blood flow to that may be more challenging than others when it comes to, you know, their ALA consumption? Well, we'll, we'll have to try them, correct? So, you know, this is, a, yeah. a, this is the big question. I mean, but, there's not many. Great, but remember that all these, there are not many, correct? And most, most cancers, most tubers will, you know, create new, new vessels, correct? They will feed themselves, correct? And, and so the, all this neurovascularization of tubers will make things even better, correct? To get, to get, yeah. to get these things there. Certainly, you know, there are some tumors that are a little more challenging where there are more, uh, scaring tissue than others, correct? Uh, but we'll just have to test it. So, for example, pancreas is one of those, correct? That's why probably immunotherapy doesn't work that well because it uh, cannot bring all the immune cells into it, correct? Uh, we, we, we have seen uh, in preclinical work that the pancreas has big uptake of 5-ALA. The question is, in vivo in a patient, how will that work? Well, we're certainly, you know, it's one yeah. one of our plans. You know, we have big plans, right? And the the plan number one right now really is to treat these patients in the cranium, correct? The DIPG and the recurrent GDM. Yeah. But but all this is part part of our plans to get this therapy as a platform to be used in any type of cancer. And certainly, you know, that will be, you know, I can visualize doing a uh, a basket trial for GI cancer, for example, correct? Where, you know, everybody yeah. with a GI cancer and, and treat them. We're already learning, you know, from our uh, our uh, recruiting GBM and DIPG, uh, our PKs and how the volume distribution and all these things, uh, which it is makes even this even more interesting, correct? So if, if one of the big problems to, to know how much therapy you're getting to the tumors, correct? So exactly how much are you really getting there? And one of the things that we do, we do a PK, we look at volume distribution, Cmax, area under the curve, all these things, and they're surrogates, correct? Or how much we think that the tumor, unless you have a biomarker, you take the tumor out, you can measure it. We really have a problem knowing how much it is. For us, okay? We know how much tumor, how much ALA is getting into the tumor because we can measure 
serum proporphyrinine. Correct? The, oh. So there is a normal level of protoporphyrin 9 in your blood, correct? Which is not very high because it's utilized to make him all the time. But now, you know, we start working on how do we correlate, you know, the, how much ALA are we giving to the tumor and how much are we getting of protoporphyrin? And potentially, we can then even, can we look at a correlation of the levels of protoporphyrin 9 in blood with tumor reduction, correct? So that's another tweak on really being able not only to have a radiologically a radiological response, but also to have a biochemical measurement of how much of the the therapy is getting at least our drug is getting into the into the tumor, and then the effect of the radiation or the ultrasound in the combination. Right? So. That's, and you're talking about a very high like sensitivity. You're talking about micro, micro, micro milliliters. Yeah, this, or, correct. Like, I'm sure it's very, to the, very sensitive right. to the micro, yeah, to the microgram or less. Just so that people know to that can appreciate what that means. Like right now, and a lot of doctors still, I guess, aren't using it. But there's this big wave where these molecular companies are either taking the DNA and fingerprint and blueprint of the cancer that was presumably biopsied or taken out and they sequence it, they, they get a bunch of maps or wanted posters, and they basically take your blood and see if you're having a recurrence or, or maybe coming back if there's a match, if there's a match of like the, the profile from what they sequenced. Or other companies will basically look at all the kind of common, you know, blueprints for the houses in this neighborhood. You know, there's these cookie cutter neighborhoods where all the houses have to look the somewhat same. the same or you can't build it. So they'll look at all those and say, hey, you're still clear or not. But what I find frustrating is I have no idea what the sensitivity is. All the companies are using different units and, and, and measurements. And, and I can, it tells me it's valuable if it's positive, but I don't know how valuable it is if it's negative. Now, what you're suggesting is you're looking on a very like biochemical level. Correct. You're saying, what is it? If I give you, let's just say, one unit of ALA and you don't have cancer, then I can see what happens at, I don't know, an hour or a day later and what those levels are if you have none. And then I can give it to someone that has it, and then I can see what those levels are of protoporphyrin at an hour and 24 hours later, and they're going to be much higher than protoporphyrin, like presumably. Eight, and sir. then when I've done the treatment, but I have to treat them. I check you a week later, are your levels the same as what they were as if you did cancer or what, by what are they reduced? Correct. So we can use that as a, really as how good their response therapy is. By the other hand, Correct. We, you can imagine, and we always, you know, obviously I cannot talk about all the things that we're doing, but you can imagine, well, what about a 5-ALA tracer, something that we can, you know, look at, you know, that our, you know, can we have attack 5-ALA intravenously that will show where there's still tumor left, for example. Correct. Right. So, like, a, like a like a much better PET scan. Correct. That's the point. Okay. And then you go and treat it with ultrasound. You shouldn't have told me that. Now I'm gonna go make it this weekend. You know, <laughs> in my in my house. I'm gonna steal that idea. Just go create it. I'm joking. That's no. That's super exciting. I love. You know, this goes back into this concept that's so new for me as someone that's only three years out. My wife and I are both oncologists, and it's just like we're just not even really taught. At least we weren't then on the significance of the metabolic, like like we are in med school, right? But, but when we're talking about oncology fellowship, we're all excited about the targets and the mutations that these cancers are able to pump out. And, and obviously when a cancer treatment stops working, it's because that thing that you were exploiting, that Achilles heel, isn't an Achilles heel anymore. Yeah. And so we keep attacking another arrow. Okay, now let's go do this and this and this. You say, you're saying, bro, in that exact word. <laughs> Stop worrying about what like it changes on the outside, what where the kink is, where the Achilles. Just think about where the heart is. Like if it like if it needs to pump, if it needs air in the air in the lungs to like Goliath does, is there a way you can just you know from the inside forget what his tools are on the outside? Yeah, Sanjay, and, Sanjay, and this is that, and there's a lot of evidence. It's not a new pseudoscience. No, it's not because the PDT has been. You know, for 20, 30 years, the use of 5-ALA, we just, right. you know, there was the genius of saying, hmm, how can we do this without putting a needle, a catheter, a laser inside the organ? Right? And th this is the beauty of it. Right? You know, the other thing, and, and I, I got the same training that you got, correct? What are the, you know, what are the, 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 
the chromosome, the you know the the antigens, all the things are different. I'm a little older than you, so I've gone through more therapies that you have done. But but the point is, and you probably had the same thing that I, I've done. We treat so hard these patients. We give them so much. They go through so much pain. The families, the you know, I, I we all have been affected in our own families, correct, with with this disease. So. To have a therapy that you give them and, and really don't make their quality of life worse, but to potentially even make it better, correct? When, you know, if you can right there, you know, go through a therapy and then start feeling, you know, w w much better, you know, in a month or less, correct? Or two months. And yeah, for me, without having diarrheas, we have an hepatitis, we are having, you know, mouth sores, you know, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. It's just um, taste changes. Taste changes, taste changes. Is like really is something I appreciate now. People are depressed in the South because we care about food so much. Like <laughs> they could be cancer free, but they're like, I can't enjoy anything anymore. And you know, cuisine and food is such a big deal. Yeah, it is. It, it, so, you know, my hope is that this therapy will give not one more Thanksgiving or one more Christmas, correct? That it, my hope is this will be a, a game changer. Uh, this is what I'm, you know, working and the whole people at Sonalysis, you know, it, it is so committed to really provide a, a therapy that is not hurtful. And, you know, and for people like you and me that have been seeing those, those patients, that have talked to this family, that have moved that patient to the ICU and still given therapies during the ICU stay, it is, you know, to have something that will not give you side effect, it, it, it is just amazing. So that's where we're working at. We're, you know, going through those clinical trials. We're excited about the opportunity with a lot, a lot of ideas how to expand this and, you know, I hope that uh, next time we talk, you know, my, my smile will be even bigger. Well, yeah, I'll tell you what can't be bigger, and that's your passion. I can tell you're very, you know, like you said, you've seen it, you've done it, you know what the pain causes, and you're passionate about trying to make an improvement to, to not just do it effectively, but to do it at a low cost and the quality of life. And, and I appreciate you for that very much. How can people enroll, uh, you know, if they if, if somebody's listening and they have GBM? And, and real quick, how long does the treatment last? Like, is it multiple cycles? Is it one thing? Correct. Like, so uh, when we started it was just a single cycle, correct? Because the idea was um, that oh, we were concerned about the safety. But after we start treating, it's like uh, nothing is happening here. So we in from the safety standpoint, so we decided then now to give m monthly therapies, correct? So we're going monthly therapies okay. uh, in this both clinical trials for the IPG and recurrent GBM. Uh, is that the best way to give it? We don't know yet, correct? So we are maximizing the therapy. Cancer is a nasty disease, so uh, we need to treat it, hit it hard, but we're hitting it hard with a feather, correct? So we're treating yeah. them. Yeah, I mean, you're being very... But we are not making life worse for these patients, right? So the hope is, you know, maybe they don't need to be treated monthly. Maybe they need to be treated every three months, you know, every six months. I, I don't have the answer, but right now I need to get to show that this therapy works. So I'm maximizing the frequency of the therapy, which is, and I can do that because the toxicity is not there. So if there was right. toxicity there, then I'll say, oh, you know, maybe, you know, I need to give them a, a, a break here, correct? And like you said, you know, for right. GBM, there's so many therapies, the patients are in so many things, and the quality of life gets decreased just by the size of the surgery. We can come and say, hey, yeah. here you go, come once a month and, you know, you, you're fine. You know, you're gonna have more than one. And it's in one day? It's, yeah, so you just the, get like an IV infusion for a few hours. It's a it's a few hours before the infusion lasts like an hour to two hours, and then um, the half life is very short because it's up, the uptake of the cells happens very fast. But then we have to wait to make sure there is enough penetration, and that can go from three to twelve hours. We usually around three hours after we have uh, 
uh, injected the patient with the uh, with the IV 5 ALA. Then they go through the uh, the uh, sonodynamic therapy that is usually around two to three hours. Correct, right? and uh, and that's it. And then they come a month later. Wow, that is unbelievable. Well, Ali, thank you so much. I can't wait to be talking about this and other things. Uh, me I too. Will be eagerly waiting to see the thing show. Yeah. Sounds great. So we are today, this week, at the Pediatrics uh, Society of Neuro-Oncology in D.C. So hopefully to keep, uh, you know, branding and showing our excitement for this therapy and to try to get more patients in our DIPG study. So if anybody has, uh, you know, anybody that has DIPG or recurrent GBM, you know, they can go to our web page, sonalysis.com or clinicaltrials.gov and look for some analysis and those um, inclusion and crucial criteria will be there. Amazing. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Sanjay. Mm-hmm.